Hello and welcome to Holy Impact Ministries Bible Study Night, a HolyImpactMinistries.com production. I'm Pastor Scott Blaine. God bless you and thank you for sharing your time with us here today. Tonight, we're continuing our Bible study on the book of Romans, once again looking into the writings of the Apostle Paul in his battle, not only with the new converts that were in the process of coming to the truth of God's Word, but also his battle with the diehard Pharisees who were entrenched in their own understanding of what the law meant to them. The Apostle Paul, also known as Rabbi Sheol, had his work cut out for him. He had several different types of people that he was dealing with. He had the brand new converts who knew nothing about the law at all, and then he had those who were Israelites by blood, but who had no real knowledge of the Torah or God's law who were being dispersed into the four corners of the earth. And then he had the diehard Pharisees who were entrenched in the law and their own man-made Talmudic laws and their version of what the law meant to them. And so there was a mixed hodgepodge, or modgepodge, if you will, of people that Paul was trying to reach with the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, and his coming kingdom. And this is why Peter told us that the writings of Paul were going to be hard to understand, and that the ignorant and the unstable would twist the writings of the Apostle Paul as they do the other scriptures. Let's once again, just to refresh what we've already visited, take a look at the warning that Peter gave us concerning the writings of the Apostle Paul. All right, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at that. I believe that was Peter, and we're going to go check that out. We've already done this last week, but we're going to do it again here just to see where that is. Peter 3, Second Peter 3.16. Where are you? There it is. Okay. Let's get over to our uh, next screen here, and we'll read that together. All right, very good. And here we have it, Second Peter 3.15. He says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks of them, of these matters. And again, this is the warning from Peter. He says, There are some things in them, speaking about the writings of Paul, that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and the unstable would twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, now here comes the warning, take care that you are not carried away uh, with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. So this is a warning that comes directly from Peter. And uh, we need to know and understand that the writings of Paul are hard to understand. And we keep repeating this over and over and over because we want people to know and to understand that there is a warning in the Bible from an apostle that says that these are hard to understand. You can't just open the book and read the writings of Paul and take them at face value and think that you're going to understand them without keeping them in the proper context knowing who he was speaking to, knowing the battles he was up against, knowing the era that he lived in, knowing what the other religions around him were teaching and preaching. Uh, these are all important things to know as we read the writings of the Apostle Paul, if we're going to keep it in the right context and understand what he was trying to say. Now, uh, I want to jump right into the book of Romans, but uh, I, wanted, I want to take just a moment here, and I just want to very quickly say a quick prayer before we get started, because this is where the rubber meets the road. And I usually like folks to to take their prayer time into their closet and to pray on their own. You know, in the 23rd chapter of Matthew, our Messiah tells uh, us about these Pharisees who like to make long prayer, and they like to do all of these things, and wear their phylacteries and their fringes long, and they like the best seats in the at the wedding places, and in, and in the they love to be greeted in the markets, and they love to do all these things, and we don't want to do those kinds of things, and uh, so oftentimes I, I count on us all to go to our prayer closets and pray to God the Father. But it is also important that we pray together, uh, and especially over this chapter that we're getting into right now, because it's just that important. It is just that important that we understand this. This is going to be 
uh, where, where Peter warns us this warning is going to come into play during this chapter of Romans. So let's pray very quickly uh, and bow our heads and just ask for the discernment that we need. If we could do that just very quickly before we start. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, we pray, Father. Hallowed is your holy name, high and far above all names. We thank you, Father, for your mercy and for your grace, for the blood that covers our heads and for your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Father. We thank you for the air that we breathe and the ground that we stand on, knowing that it belongs to you. We ask, Lord Yahweh God, that you would bless this video teaching, this home Bible study that we are all together in, and each person who hears it and sees this video, Father, we ask for a blessing, for the discernment to be able to understand the writings of the Apostle Paul. We know, Father, of the warning that was given, and we know why Paul spoke the way he did speak, because the, our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, also spoke in parables, and in ways that were difficult for the wicked ones to understand, and the seed of Satan, so that they would not understand. We pray, Father, for those who take the time to sit down and to listen and to follow this through to the end, Father, that you would give them the blessing of discernment, that they may be able to understand. In your holy name, Father, we pray in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, the only name in heaven by which we can come to you to ask these things. Amen. All right, very good. Now, let's jump into... The Book of Romans. I'm ready. I hope you're ready. And uh, let's go here. I think I got that bookmarked here. We can go ahead and just jump right in here. Now, this is going to be... I'm excited. I'm excited. This is going to be great. We're going to love this. And I think you're really going to get... Uh, you're going to get something out of this. Because there's a lot of things that he talks about in this chapter. Let's have a cup of coffee. Let's have a drink here before we get started. That's always a good thing to do. In the name of Yeshua. Thank you, Father. Good coffee. Okay. Now, let's begin. It says here, it says, <clears throat> and I have my screen up, so we make sure we have that uh, this week. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself, because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? Because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be Revealed. Now, I want to stop right there, and I want to talk a little bit about this. How many times have you heard, don't judge? Don't judge. You're not supposed to judge, right? Let's take a look at this, and I just want to kind of break this down uh, a little bit. Let me take you to a couple of uh, passages here so that we know that there is a difference between righteous judgment and unrighteous judgment, okay? Okay. Uh, we're going to go to John 7.24, so let's go to John 7, and I'm going to bounce down here to uh, 24. This is Yeshua speaking, and what does he say? He says, do not judge by appearance, but judge with right judgment. How many Christians out there have been lied to so often that they just don't feel like they're supposed to judge? This is another deception and another lie that we as Christians need to get beyond. We need to understand. This is the words of our Messiah. Remember, they're written in red. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with righteous judgment, with right judgment. Okay? Now, with that being said, let's go to another scripture. I want to show you another scripture here. 1 Corinthians 2.5. So, let's go to 1 Corinthians 2.5. Oh, I'm sorry, 15. Down here at the bottom. Can you read that? Yeah. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. Okay? This is, again, the, the Apostle Paul speaking. He says, Whoops. For who has understood the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? 
But we have the mind of Christ. Does Christ live in you? Do you have the Holy Spirit? Do you know and do you understand? Are you praying for discernment? Are you studying your Bible? Then you can be a righteous judge. The problem is, my friends, is that many of these uh, people that are out there today, and especially these modern-day Pharisees and scribes, as I like to call them, uh, are doing the very same things that they're teaching not to do. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as we as we go ahead. Let's look at Matthew seven twenty one because I really want to bear down on this because this is so important for so many Christians. Here's what our Messiah says. Now he says, "Do not ju- or judge not that you be not judged." Okay. Now that's what you usually hear from most people who don't want to get caught in their sin. And if you go to a brother and you say, "Hey, look," you say, "Oh, do not judge lest you be judged." Right. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're judging a brother for committing adultery, but you're not committing adultery, then that's righteous judgment. However, if you are committing adultery and you're going to your brother and saying, don't commit adultery, you got a problem there. Okay, that is punishable. Okay, you cannot do that. And this is what uh, our Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, warned us against describing the Pharisees. He said in the first chapter of Matthew 23, 1, he says, uh, they sit in the seat of Moses. He says, so do what they tell you, but don't do what they do because they don't practice what they preach. Okay? So, uh, again, he's warning us not to be like that, not to judge someone with the whole time while we're doing it. And that's exactly what this passage says. Let's read the whole thing. It says, judge not that you not be judged. Okay? For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that's in your own eye? Or can you, can you, or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, he says. First take the log out of your own eye, and then what does he say? Then, then does he say, then don't worry about it, just go about your business? No. He says, you hypocrite, he says, first take the log out of your own eye, then you can judge him, then you can see. He says, then you can see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Okay, so he's not saying, uh, don't judge lest uh, that you not be judged. Uh, what he's saying here is, judge not that you might that you be not judged if you're doing the same things. He says, be careful, because if you judge someone and you're doing the same thing that you, and you're judging your brother for, that's going to be double indemnity on you. It's not going to go well for you uh, when you are standing before the Father. But he says right here clearly in Matthew 7, 5, once you take that log out of your own eye and you're not doing these things and you are innocent of these things, then you can judge and you can help your brother get that out of his eye because you've taken it out of your eye. Okay? <clears throat> and so that's what he's saying. Okay, 1 Corinthians 5, 9. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. I just want to really get this. I really want to sew this, lock this down. Now listen to what Paul says. He says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters of this world. Since then, you would need to go out of this world. So who's he talking to about in this scripture? He's talking about people of the world. He says, I wrote to you not to associate with sexual immoral people, not meaning the people of this world. He says, because they're all like that. He says, you'll have to, you'd have to come out of the world. But now he starts talking, when we get into the yellow, he's talking about the church now. Listen to what he says. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. Do we see that? <clears throat> not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reveler, a drunkard, a swindler, he said, don't even eat with such a one. And he's talking about those who call themselves brother, those who are in the church. If they are that way and they're acting like people that are outside, don't do anything with them. Just stay away from them. Listen to what he says. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? He says, I don't. we don't judge outsiders. If, you're, if the person doesn't call himself a brother, we don't judge them. They, God judges them. Okay? We only judge those within the church, within the body of Christ, within the olive tree. Okay? So he says, is it, not, uh, uh, is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Yes, of course. He says, this is the answer to that is yes. He says, God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. My friends, if you're having a Bible study and someone is 
showing up with alcohol on their breath and uh, you know, and picking up on the lady that's sitting next to them uh, who's married and or or one thing or another. Listen, uh, you are to judge that, brother. And you're to say, listen, brother, but don't judge him if you're doing the same thing is what is, is being presented here. And this is, this is interesting. Most Christians don't even know this. If you are if someone is outside the world and doesn't even claim to be a Christian, then we've got no business judging them because God will judge them. He, God will judge those outside. We are to judge those who call themselves brother. If you, if you say you're a Christian, if you say you're a brother, then we are to judge one another. We are to help one another. Okay? Okay, very good. Uh, let's go to Matthew 7.15 very quickly here. I just want to, I want to really wrench this down. Matthew 7.15. Okay, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Okay, so are we to judge someone by their fruits? Yes, we are. If we don't see what they're doing, we are to judge. If we don't judge someone by their fruits, we're just going to just let them say whatever they want to say and do whatever they want to do. Is that helping a brother? No, it's not. Absolutely not. He said, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? He said, so every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. Again, we are to judge. One more time, James 5.19. We're going to clamp this down. I don't want anybody to ever say this again uh, about, oh, you can't judge me. Let's take a look and let's see what's going on here. 5 James, and this is 5.19 we're turning to now. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now, how can we bring a brother back if we're not even going to judge whether or not he's sinning or not? Does that make any sense to you? It, it shouldn't. Okay, we've got to judge ourselves. We've got to be in that community. And if we see a brother doing or something or straying away, we need to save his soul and we need to cover that multitude of sins by bringing him back and, and confronting him and saying, hey, what are you doing? Stop that. That's wrong. Don't teach that. Don't preach that. Don't do that. Okay? Important <clears throat> information for us to know. Okay. Now, uh, another thing, uh, Matthew 18.5, and I want to touch on this because this is important. Uh, Matthew 18.5, those of you who are having home Bible studies, I want you to pay attention to this. Okay. Again, red letter words from our Messiah. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. Now, there's another whole Bible study on this two or three witnesses idea, but we won't get into that right now. He says, if he refuses to listen to them, then tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen to even the church, he says, then let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Cut him off. Again, Yeshua is saying, set him outside the church. Okay? Comes a time when you just have to say, look, you can't be inside uh, our Bible study, inside of our church, when we are worshiping and praising God and learning the things of God. And you're breaking his laws the whole time. And you're teaching children and other people here to do the same thing. We, you have to be set outside the church. And uh, sometimes that is harsh enough to get their attention, to make them realize, hey, everybody believes that I need to be set outside the church. Maybe I am wrong. Maybe I am doing something wrong. Okay, so just the idea of judging uh, in, the, uh, in this chapter. I want us to know and understand what he's talking about. As we read through this, the rest of the chapter here, in the book of Romans, we'll see that concept that I'm talking about, okay? Okay, very good. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, uh, you are storing up wrath for yourself. We read that uh, on uh, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to what? His works. Now, many people will say, I'm not saved by works. I'm saved by grace. And you are correct. You are correct. However, Work, faith without works is dead, according to James. Now, James is no small apostle. 
James uh, was the one that they always took everything to. He was the head of the Jerusalem council. He was the brother of Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> and whenever the apostles had a uh, discrepancy, they took it to James at the Jerusalem council. That's where they went. And we're going to see that very soon. Uh, uh, and uh, I think you're going to be amazed by this if you don't already know this. So, but James says that faith without works is dead. So the body, apart from the soul, is dead. So faith is dead without works, he says. Okay, so just like the body without its soul is dead, so faith without works, indeed, is dead. Okay, so each, he will render each one according to his works. So do, are works important? Yes, they are. They don't save you. The grace of God saves you. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says, he who says he knows him and does not keep his commandments is what? You got it. He's a liar, and the truth is not in him, and we know that. We've read that scripture many, many times. So, if that's true, if he who says he knows him, okay, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, then again, what James says is exactly right. Faith without works is dead, and here we find it, Paul even telling us, he will render to each one according to his works. To those who, uh, by patience in well-doing, seek for the glory and the honor and immortality, Okay, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, how are we to worship God in spirit and in truth? If we do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, okay, there will be wrath and fury. And again, what was what did we say righteousness was? Righteousness, we know what righteousness is according to the word of God. That's doing the things of God, keeping his laws, his commandments, his precepts, and all of those things, okay? That's what righteousness is, okay? But obey righteousness. Okay, let's read that again. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, which means they're not following the laws, the commandments, the precepts of God, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first and also the Greek. And if you don't know why the Jew first and also the Greek, please watch the first part of Romans that we did in our last session. And you'll understand that. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first and also the Gentile, the Greek, the Goyim. For God knows no partiality. For all who have sinned, now listen to this, this is getting important now. I'm going to stop right here because right here at Romans 2.12, this is where we get into Peter's warning. The rest of this scripture, or the rest of this chapter in Second uh, Roman of Second Romans, is going to be. We're going to need to take that advice from Peter because this is going to be difficult to understand. Okay, so put on your armor and and get ready. Okay, listen to what Paul says: For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. Who's he talking about? Without the law, who doesn't have the law? It would be the Greek. It would be the Goyim, also known as the Gentile, okay? The greenhorn. He doesn't know anything about, never had the law. He's not a Jew, he, or he's a Jew uh, that was dispersed uh, from the northern kingdom. Many generations had gone by, and a lot of them had forgotten the things of God. So he was a Jew-Gentile. Even though he was a Jew by blood, he was a Gentile. He wasn't keeping the things of God at all, okay? So you have the greenhorns, and then you had those who were being, those Jews who had just forgotten God, okay? Either way, you're a Gentile. You're out of Gentile means out of covenant. There's no such thing as a Gentile Christian, really. Gentile means out of covenant. So just know that. So that's who he's talking about here. So for all who have sinned without the law will also will also perish without the law. That's those who don't have the law. And he's ta now he's talking to the Pharisees. Okay, two separate groups. And all who have sinned under the law, who has the law? The Jews, the Pharisees, right? He says, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. Okay? So two different people here, and that's why we have that highlighted in red and in blue. Two groups that Paul's talking to. Okay? He's got to, he's got to get through to both of them. Let's read it all together again. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, you Gentiles. And all of you who have sinned under the law, you Pharisees, you will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. 
Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, the same one that many biblical scholars will tell you always preached against the laws of God. And here he is saying, it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but it is the doers of the law. Big difference. Big difference. Okay? So are we are we still in line here? Let's still let's stay in line here. Paul not teaching against circumcision here, not teaching against God's laws. In fact, he's teaching for God's laws here, okay? Now, let's continue. For when Gentiles do not have the law, by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel... God judges the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. So what's he saying here? He's saying the Gentiles don't have the law, but they do what is right, what is good. A man can still be good because the law is written on his heart. He is a good man because it's written in his heart. What in what indeed was the new covenant? I want to talk a little bit about the... Uh, people talk about the old covenant. Oh, I'm not in the old covenant anymore. I'm in the new covenant, right? Well, let's look at that. Let's look at some of these things. Um... Let's see here. Let's look at James 1.22. That's the one I wanted to go to, James 1.22. So let's go to James, and we're going to go to 1, and we're going to go to 22 here. And what does James say? He says the same thing that it says in Romans, right here. Be But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. What are these men doing that are preaching that all God's laws are nailed to the cross? What are they doing? They're doing this right here. They are deceiving themselves. What does James say? But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself, and then he goes away, and then he forgets what he looks like. Okay? So again, James here teaching and preaching the same thing that Paul just got done saying, and this is very, very important. Okay, I want to read something else to you. Psalms 37, 31. Okay, Psalms 30. Now, many people will say, well, you know, the the laws of God uh, are a bondage, and we know they're bondage. They're, it's all bondage, because that's what uh, Paul taught. Well, number one, that's not what Paul taught, and we'll get into some of that. But listen to what it says in Psalms. This is Psalms uh, 37, 31. The law of God is is in his heart. His steps do not slip. Again, the laws of God being in the heart of the Gentile, being in the heart of the Jew, being in the heart of man. That's what he wants in Jew and Gentile alike. He wants your heart to drive you to keep his laws. He doesn't want you to keep his laws because you feel like you have to keep his laws or because you're going to earn your way into heaven. You see, when, when God's, God's laws in the past were very mechanical, whoops, I sinned, let me get the knife, grab the lamb, go do the sacrifice, and it was very mechanical, okay? Now, it is no longer mechanical. We have seen what our Messiah had to go through. He was beaten. He was scourged. He was humiliated. He, was, he had to crawl to the cross to give his very life for us. We see how they mocked him, how they beat him, how they scourged him. We saw the blood left on the ground that trailed behind him. We saw that he was beaten so badly he was unrecognizable, the Bible says. You see, to keep God's laws now is not mechanical for us any longer. We see the cost of sin. We've seen it. We know it. And his laws are indeed written in our hearts because of what his son did. It's no more mechanical about, okay, I sinned and now I have to go get a, a, a lamb and sacrifice it or a dove or whatever it is I had to go get and it's just dup, 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 dup. Now, it means much more to us, much more to us after seeing that, that Yahweh God the Father gave his only begotten son to be sacrificed, humiliated, beaten. We can see our wickedness. You know, when many people see the cross, they think grace, dispensational grace. 
But that's not what we see when we see the cross. You see, we realize who we really are, that God had to give his only begotten son to die such a horrible death because of our wretchedness, because of our nakedness, because of our sinful nature. That cross means something very different to those of us who are truly grafted into the olive tree. The law of God is in his heart. His steps do not slip. Let's look at Psalm 40 and 8. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. It's within my heart is where it is. Okay? Let's look at Psalm 119.34. We're talking about God's laws here. You know, the, the laws that people say are bondage and, and they're a curse and all of this. 119, let's take a look at the 31st verse here. What does it say? Give me understanding that I may what? Keep your law and observe it with what? With what? With my whole heart. You see, it's about the heart, and that's what we're going to be talking about. What Paul is trying to get through to both groups, both the greenhorns who don't have any religion at all, don't, don't know anything about the law, who are brand new, and those die hard who have misunderstood the law and written their own laws over top of the law, which were the, the scribes and the Pharisees. So are we kind of getting the idea? I just want us to get the idea. It is so very, very important for us to know and to understand and to get this. Let's take a look at Jeremiah 31, 31, because this is the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Let's take a look at that. And what do we find? It says this. Now, this is the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. People talk about the New Covenant. Well, here it is. And this is what it says. Let's be wise as serpents and kind as doves, knowing what the New Covenant says. What does it say? Does it say that the laws are nailed to the cross? Or does it say he wrote the laws in our hearts? Let's read. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now, remember... If you are a Christian, if you are in Christ, you are the offsprings of Abraham, heirs to the promise. You are part of the olive tree, grafted in, according to the 11th chapter of Romans. We are Israelites, okay? I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. That's you and me, my friends, in the house of Judah. It says, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke. Though I was their husband, remember, God divorced the northern kingdom. He divorced them and dispersed them into the four corners of the earth, okay? He says, I was their husband, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, he says, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. My friends, anybody who understands and knows what Yeshua Mashiach did cannot possibly not have his laws written in our hearts. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. And then we move into the fulfillment of uh, this covenant. This doesn't come until after the new millennial kingdom comes, when his kingdom comes. And that's when it continues on. So this part here is before the millennial reign, and this is after the millennial reign. He says then, he says, And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. And, and of course, today we still have pastors, preachers, and some people call the fivefold ministry, uh, out there that that God has given to teach and to bring the fullness of the body of Christ up. But in those days, when his new coming kingdom comes, this will be the fulfillment of this new covenant. And there will be no more pastors, preachers, teachers, none of that kind of stuff. We won't need them anymore because we'll all know him. And uh, th those things will be all passed away. 
and he will completely forgive our iniquity, and that's when we actually get our crown, okay? That's when his new kingdom comes. But I just want us to know and understand what he's saying here, again, about writing the laws in your heart. Does it say anywhere in here that he nailed, he's going he's gonna to do away with his laws in this new covenant? No. So when somebody tells you, well, I'm under the new covenant, what you need to tell them is, you need to go read the new covenant, my friend. Go read it. You can find it in Jeremiah 31, 31. Let's take a look at Ephesians in the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah. And we want to go to 4.10 here. Let's take you to 4.10. Now, let's listen to this. He who is descended is the one who is also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists and the shepherds and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ until we attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, listen to this now, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Okay, now why does it say that? Because we're still living in Babylon. Right now, we all live in Babylon right now, just as the Israelites used to live in Babylon. Again, we don't have a temple, we don't have the Levites, we don't have the priesthood of Aaron, who you had to be a descendant of Aaron to be a high priest. We have no high priest here on this earth right now. We have none of these things, so a lot of the laws of God and a lot of the things of God we can no longer keep. But we keep what we can because we know his coming kingdom is coming and those things will all be reinstituted. And we've talked about that at Holy Impact Ministries uh, before. So I just want us to know that and I want us to understand that. One more scripture, John uh, 14, 23. And I just want to really lock this down, 14 and 23. What does it say? Listen to this, red letter words from the Messiah. In that day... You will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Who is it that loves him? Those who keep his commandments, who has his commandments, and they keep them. Okay? And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. And then Judas said to him, he said, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Jesus said to him, that if anyone loves me, he will keep my word. In other words, I will know who he is. He will be keeping my word. And my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. So he will be separate and apart. And I will know who he is as well. And the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Okay? So we need to know and understand one more time. He who loves him keeps his commandments. And we see this over and over and over and over again. The laws of God are written on the hearts of men. Now, let me ask you, my friends. Are God's laws written on your heart? Or are they nailed to the cross? Which one? Which one? God says, in the New Covenant, I will write my laws on their hearts. Through what Yeshua Hamashiach, Jesus Christ, did at that cross, his laws indeed have been written, engraved deeply in our hearts. And those of us who love him keep his commandments. Okay? So, I just want us to uh, see that as we're moving through and this is exactly why Paul says it's not the hearers of the law who are, are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Okay? So, a lot to learn there, a lot to know that. I just want to take us two scriptures. I want to lock them together. I want to just show you how the Word of God flows like a river. It does not, uh, uh, it does not conflict. Okay? If it conflicts, then something's wrong. We're not understanding something. We need to go back. We need to pray for that discernment and let him fix it in us, okay? So, it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Keep that in your mind as we read down, because this is going to get hairy now. And again, Peter's warning, Paul's writings are hard to understand. The ignorant and the unstable will twist them to their own destruction. Don't be carried away by lawless people, okay? 
So let's continue. Here we're getting into the dangerous waters, and I just want to really lock this down and you get ready. Here it comes, because you're going to be confused here in a few minutes. For when Gentiles, who, who okay, we did this already. <laughs> Very good. So we know that the Gentiles, uh, who do not have the law, uh, are good people. Because the law is written in them, they will be judged by the same law that the Jews are judged by. You're, what he's saying is you're all one. You're all going to be judged by the laws of Yahweh God the Father. Whether you have the law or whether you don't have the law, whether it's written on your heart, uh, you, you've got to have it. You have to have it written on your heart. You cannot follow it letter, letter by letter by letter and think you're going to earn your way in. You have to be led in your heart to do the things of God. What is the definition of the love of God? For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Okay. So let's continue on here now. Uh, all right, uh, here, here we go. Now, let's, let's start to pick up at Romans 2.17. He says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, you then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? He says, while you preach against stealing, do you steal? And again, here we go into that whole preaching and judging thing again. Okay, what's he saying? He's saying, are, are you preaching these things and then doing them? Are, as you're teaching this, are you not learning anything yourself? And that's what he's saying. While you preach against stealing, do you steal? Uh, you say that one must not commit adultery. Do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. Okay, the, so what, who's he talking to here? You who boast in the law. Who boasts in the law? The Pharisees. Okay, the Pharisees. The, the, the diehard, we have the law, we have the answers. It's all about us and our fringes and, and all who are stature in life and all this other kind of stuff. He says, you guys who have the law are blaspheming God by breaking the law. You're teaching and you're not doing, you're not preaching what you're teaching. And, and, or you're not, uh, you're not doing what you're preaching. Okay. And again, we can pick this up in uh, Matthew 23, first verse. Let's check this out very quickly. Let's jump over there. Matthew 23, first verse. He says, Then Jesus said to the crowds and disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, Sit on Moses' seat, do and observe whatever they tell you, but not the works they do, for they preach, but they do not practice. Okay, just wanted to mention that, remind that, to put that in your memory. That's what he's talking about here. He doesn't want us like that. He doesn't want us to be doing those kinds of things. Okay. Okay. Very good. And uh, son of law will be judged by the law. And I lost my place here. What do you call it? Your Jew? Rely on the Jew? The voice of God? Okay. Okay. Do you not teach yourself? You who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. This is where we left off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to Romans 2.24. For it is written, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Now, many people think, in fact, the Pharisees took the name of God out of the Bible, for those of you who do not know, and they replaced it. And the King James Bible replaced it with the word Lord. Now, we know that a Lord is a 16th century land baron. We know that. Uh, is God a Lord? Uh, is he a 16th century land baron? No, not really. But we use that because lords in the British, uh, in King James' time, were always bowed down to, and they were knelt down to. So God would be a kind of a Lord, okay? But the, if you look at your Bible and you do a word study on the word Lord, you will find that, that that word Lord covers up in the Hebrew uh, writings, in the Hebrew, actual Hebrew transcripts, the name of God, which is Yahweh. It is spelled in Hebrew, yod Hey vav Hey. There are four letters, the Yod, the Hey, vav and the Hey. And this spells out Yahweh. Some people pronounce it Yahovah. You'll hear it pronounced that way. And the this this was all started by the Pharisees. The, you now, I want you to know and understand that God wrote his name in the Bible over 6,500 times. He wrote his, his name in that Bible over at least over 6,000 6, times. And they covered it up with Lord. So we, we need to know that. We need to understand these things. And it was the Pharisees' fault that they did this, because the Pharisees said, well, you know, they didn't want somebody not to capitalize his name or to use it out of uh, 
uh, or out of the ordinary or one thing or another to blaspheme his name. But what they didn't understand is what does it say here? How do you profane the name of God? If you look at your Bible, throughout the Bible, the way we profane his name is by breaking his laws. That's how we profane his name. By not keeping his Sabbaths, by not keeping his commandments, by not keeping his, his appointments, his Moedim. That's how we profane the name of God. It's not by not capitalizing his, his name uh, that we profane his name. Uh, and this is what he says here. And he's telling them uh, right here, and I lost my spot here, as I always do. He says, you boast in the law, you dishonor God by breaking the law. Okay, so you're dishonoring God. For it is written, the name of the God, it, name of God, which is Yahweh, is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. So the Gentiles are looking at you. You're supposed to be my people. You're not doing what I say. You're blaspheming my name. You're profaning my name. Okay, so let's understand that as Christians. Let's know that as Christians. When we're not doing the things of God, when we're not keeping his Sabbath, when we're not taking seriously what he said, and we're doing all of these worldly things and, and flat out just breaking his laws, we are profaning his name. Okay, now here we go. Boy, this is good. we're getting into the circumcision part. Hold on to your seats there. Fasten your seat belts. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. Now, the Pharisees knew this very well. If they broke one of the law, commandments of the law, they broke the whole law, okay? They understood that. So this is what Paul's telling them. He says, for, so if you're circumcised and you break, a, uh, uh, if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision, okay? So he asked the question, so if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, Will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Now, this is where his writings get difficult to understand, just as Peter said. Okay, let's check this. Let's check this. Let's keep an eye on these two scriptures and let's concentrate. Okay, we got to go slow. We're going to slow down here. For circumcision indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision, you Pharisees. So if a man, you Gentile, say this Gentile, if this Gentile guy who's uncircumcised, if he keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision regard be regarded as circumcision? Now, uh, I want us to kind of look at this. <laughs> and I have some scriptures here uh, that I want to talk to you about to, to before we get too entrenched in this. If a Gentile, does and keeps the laws. And that Pharisee, what did he say in Matthew 23, 1? What did we just read? They they preached, but they didn't practice what they preached, right? Who's the, What he's saying here is that Gentile who is uncircumcised is now going to be able to judge you. He's going to be able to not only judge you, but to condemn you, you Pharisee. Even though you have the law, even though you're circumcised, you, he's going to condemn you because he's keeping the precepts of the law and you're breaking them. Okay? Let's read on. He says, Then he who is physically uncircumcised, he's talking about the Gentile now, but keeps the law, will condemn you who have written the code and circumcision, but you break the law. Okay? So what he's saying here to the to the Pharisees is, you know, you, you think you got it all locked up because you're circumcised and because you have the law and you're, yeah, you're, you know, you're at the top of the heap. He says, you're not at the top of the heap. He says, if you're breaking God's laws, you're right down here with the Gentile. Okay? And if the Gentile's keeping the laws, he's above you. He's going to condemn you. Okay? And again, this is Paul's way of bringing these two groups together. Do you see what he's trying to do? He's got, he's, he's got the uncircumcised new convert sitting on one side of the church and the Pharisees sitting in a group on the other side of the church. Remember in high school you used to do that? The jocks would sit in one side, the burnouts would sit in another side, the cheerleaders would sit over here, and everybody kind of sat together. Well, you, this is how the churches were. And he was trying to, to meld them together. He's trying to bring them together. So he's trying to tell them, you know, you circumcision group, you Pharisees, don't think, you know, just because it says first to the Jew and then to the Gentile, don't think that you're going to get away with something uh, over these Gentiles. We are all one olive tree, and we all must uh, heed the, the word of God. And if we love God, we will do that. Okay? 
Okay, now, so let's continue on. He says this, and this gets even a little bit more sticky. He says, now, nowhere in here, notice, nowhere in here does Paul say, don't get circumcised. He doesn't say that. That's not written anywhere in, the, in here so far. Can we agree on that much? Nowhere in here does Paul say, don't get circumcised, or that circumcision is of no effect. Doesn't say that. He doesn't say that. Okay? Now, let's read on a little bit further, because it seems like he's kind of saying that. Okay? Remember now, also, circumcision was part of the law. Circumcision is part of the law. Okay? So let's remember that. Um, let's see here. All right. Let's continue on here. Okay. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Okay? So now this is where you get a lot of people coming in and they're saying, looky there. See, circumcision is, is, it nor, is not outward and physical. It's of the heart, so you don't have to be circumcised, is what they're saying. All right, stop right there, hit the skids. The writings of Paul are hard to understand. What did he just say? It's not the hearers of the law that will be justified before God, but the doers of the law. Circumcision is in the law. The Pharisees know that. So why exclude circumcision if we've got to obey the law, right? doesn't make any sense. Again, writings of Paul are hard to understand. In one sense, Paul's speaking out the side of his mouth saying, it's not the hearers of the law, but the doers of the law. And then here he's saying, go ahead and break the law. You don't have to be circumcised. Is that what he's saying? No, that's not what he's saying. Let's listen. Let's ask God for discernment here. He says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is, a, nor is circumcision outward and physical. Let's replace circumcision with baptism. Can we do that for a moment? Let's replace, because they're interchangeable, my friends. Is baptism the law of God? It is, of Yahweh. He says, you must be baptized by both the water and the Spirit, or you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the remission of your sins, and you will re receive the, 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 Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And it's a promise unto you and your children and all who are far off, right? So it is commanded to be baptized, and it is commanded to be circumcised in, in the law, right? According to the law, right? Yeshua added to the law when he said, you've got to be baptized, okay? You need to go down in the grave with me and come back up out of that water new, just like I did. You need to follow me, do everything I did, including being buried and being brought back to life again, okay? So, let me ask you this. We're going to take circumcision now. We're going to trade it for baptism, okay? Let's change that around, and let's read it this way. For no one is a Jew or a Christian who is merely one outwardly, nor is baptism outward and physical. Are we beginning to get that now? Baptism is not outward and it's not physical any more than circumcision is outward. And figure, let me say this. Say my daughter's 13, 14, 15 years old, and I say, you're getting baptized, young lady. And I take her down to the river and I baptize her and I make her get baptized. Is she baptized? No, she's not. Because she wasn't moved in her heart to be baptized. The law of God was not written in her heart. Or she would have done it on her own. You must do it. I can't force someone to be baptized. All of these little babies that the Catholics baptize are not baptized. You cannot baptize someone against their will. And that's what Paul is saying here. Okay, It must come from the heart. Okay, if someone loves God, if this Gentile person loves God so much that he's keeping God's laws, okay, and you're breaking God's laws, even though you're circumcised, he's going to get into the gates of heaven, and you're not. That's what Paul's trying to tell them, okay? Again, he's trying to weld these people together into one tree and make them realize there's really no difference between this Pharisee and this Gentile. We're all one. We all got to abide. We all love the same God. He's all our Father. He created all of us in his image. We are all part of the olive tree. We are all offsprings of Abraham. Okay. See what he's doing? He's trying to weld them together. Okay. So now let's read that one more time. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outward, nor is circumcision outward and physical. What, so what he's saying, when you're circumcised, that's a spiritual thing that you do. You Pharisees cannot grab these new guys and force them to be circumcised and think their circumcision is of any effect. It's not. 
because you forced them to do so. Okay, they must be moved on their own to be circumcised. And I'm going to prove this to you right now in the scriptures. Now, when Paul, and we're going to have to go to Acts to do it, okay? So be prepared, we're going to go to Acts. When Paul had a problem with these Pharisees, because they kept on saying, you got to be circumcised, you got to be circumcised to be saved, you got to be circumcised to be saved, and Paul kept saying, no, 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 no. It's not about the, the, circ the physical circumcision. It's about the heart. The heart, it must be a spiritual thing. You must be moved. You can't force someone to be circumcised, okay? So he had this argument, and they kept arguing and arguing and arguing. So finally, who did they take it to? James, the brother of Yeshua, who was the, the head of the Jerusalem council. Anytime the, the apostles had a problem, they took it to James. Let's go look in the book of Acts 15, and let's see what the actual... Uh, decision was. Here it is. Now here's the decision. You go through the whole, I'm just going to make it short so we don't read the, have to read the whole thing. This is James' judgment. This is what James says. Okay? Now listen to this because you're going to have people arguing with you day and night, all day, because they don't understand this. If you understand this, you're, you're going to be blessed. And I think you are going to be blessed. Listen. This is James. He says, Therefore my judgment is. Okay? James is speaking. This is my judgment. He says that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Okay, he's talking about circumcision. He said, let's not trouble them with circumcision right off the bat. But we should write to them to abstain from... He's going to do, tell them to do four things. Number one, uh, stay away from things that are polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. Now, are those four things in the law of God? Yes, they are. Where is circumcision? How come circumcision isn't in there? Because you can't be forced to be circumcised. That has to be done by the heart. So he said, let's give them these easy things that they can do, and they can kind of feel what it feels like to start obeying the laws of God, and they'll, they'll be blessed for doing these things. And then what does he say? He says, for from ancient... Read this. I'm going to highlight this so everybody can see it. For from ancient generations, Moses has been read in every city who proclaim him. Okay? Let's read it again, because I, I think I misspoke there. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him. In other words, they're reading the book of Moses. They're reading the Pentateuch, the Torah. Okay? They're reading the... Oh, sorry about that. They're reading the Torah. The law of God, okay? For he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Let me ask you this, my friends. In today's modern day churches, are the laws of Moses being read? Because they were back then, weren't they? Certainly were. So what is James saying here? He's saying, listen, let's give them four easy things to do. Then they're going to hear Moses being read in the synagogues every, every Sabbath, every Saturday. They'll be moved to get circumcised on their own as they are filled with the Spirit. And then it will be a righteous circumcision. It will be a spiritual circumcision. And it will be a circumcision that counts, not one that was forced upon them. Okay, so this is the wisdom of James. He knows. Okay, <clears throat> Now let's take a break here. I'm going to go further and I'm going to prove this is exactly true and that we're not uh, kind of guessing about this. You should already know from what we see here that what we're saying is true, but I'm going to nail it down for you. Hold on. Okay, <clears throat> so he says, let's give them these four things and then from ancient, ancient generations, Moses is going to be read in the synagogues every, every Saturday, every Sabbath, okay? So he knows this. So in other words, as they hear the law, they'll obey the law. Okay? These are easy things. Let's let them do them first. Now, let's continue on. What does it say here? It says, so what happens after this? Now this decree that James gave, okay, he says, therefore, this is my judgment. Okay? This is the decree that James gives, right? They put it in a letter, and they start distributing it to all the churches. Okay? Let's go down just a few sentences here. It, it says what? So when they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. What letter? The letter that is the judgment that, that James just made, right? Okay, so they delivered the letter, and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Okay? 
So what happens just a little bit later? If we go, go down a few more sentences and we get into the 16th chapter right at the top here, it says, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him. Paul circumcises Timothy. Now, if there was no, if, if, if James' decree was not to circumcise, then why would Paul circumcise Timothy? And listen to this now. Because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. So Timothy's father was a Greek. That's why he wasn't circumcised. His mother was Jewish, but his father was a Greek. And his mother, uh, again, part of the northern kingdom that was in the process of being disseminated. into the, they, She had completely forgotten the Torah and was married to this Greek guy. So Timothy was never circumcised. So Paul had to circumcise him. Now, there are those who will lie to you. Now, pay attention and get ready for this because they're going to lie to you. They're going to say, see, they did this because the Jews, that's where they were going where the Jews were, and they were trying to trick the Jews. That's what they're trying to tell you. Many people will say, well, they, they circumcised Timothy to trick the Jews into believing that Timothy was uh, a good Jew. Where in the word of God does it say to trick people, to lie to people, to be deceitful? Would Paul have ever been deceitful about spreading the word of God? Absolutely not. That is preposterous. And that's what many of these biblical scholars will tell you. Oh, well, that's why, that's why Paul circumcised Timothy, because he was going into this place where all the Jews were. Yeah, and they knew what the law was, and that's to be circumcised, right? And listen to this. This really tops it off. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for the observance and the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and the elders who were in Jerusalem. So they have this decree, and they're delivering it to all the churches, right? Just like we said, they're the letter. This is the decree that James had made about circumcision, right? Now, if they were delivering a letter that said you don't have to be circumcised, why in the world would Paul have ever circumcised Timothy? And why would Timothy go through so much pain and trouble when he didn't need to? Do you see? It doesn't make any sense. Paul would never have circumcised Timothy and then delivered a letter that said you don't have to be circumcised. He would have not circumcised Timothy, and he would have said, look, here's the letter from James. It's a decision. We don't have to be circumcised. Okay? There's no reason for Paul to circumcise Timothy while delivering this decree if he didn't have to be circumcised. Okay? So, obviously, James' or yeah, James' judgment was not to not be circumcised. It was simply to, to give them four things to do to get them started, to get them to know and understand the blessings that they would receive by obeying the things of God. And then the, the laws of Moses would be written, the laws of God, actually, that he gave to Moses to write, okay? Let's not get misunderstood there. Uh, the laws of Moses are God's laws. There's no such things as the laws of Moses. You hear that a lot. But it, remember, they are. he's just a scribe. He just wrote them down. They are God's laws. So, at any rate, um, and I don't want to get us too sideways here, but we can know and we can understand that the judgment that was, and this is Acts 15, this is the whole thing about circumcision, proves that circumcision is, is still God's laws, and it still should be kept by those of us who love God. We will be, we will do the things of God, just like he, James tells us, and just like the letter that they were delivering, and that's why Paul circumcised Timothy. Okay. Now, Paul did not circumcise Titus. That's another story. And again, he was trying to prove to the Pharisees that uh, because they were trying to force him to be, and uh, Titus was not ready on his own accord to be circumcised. And we have to remember that even Abraham was not circumcised until he was well into his 90s. He had already been promised to be the father of all nations before he was. He was an uncircumcised Gentile at that point in time. When Abraham was given the uh, the promise, okay, he wasn't he wasn't circumcised to clear up into his nineties before he finally got circumcised. So, so this was the decree on circumcision. So we can know and understand that in the in the second chapter of uh, Romans, Paul's not preaching against circumcision. He's just pri he's te he's preaching about a righteous spiritual circumcision, not one that you're just forced to do. And it's the same thing, and, and I tell people a lot of times, if you have a problem um, explaining this, use baptism at, in the place of circumcision, because more modern-day Christians today, we relate to baptism like the uh, Pharisees related to un circumcision. Okay, Same thing. I can't force you to be baptized. It's of no effect. 
It is of no effect. Uh, and you have to want to be baptized. Your heart, by the Spirit, you must move on your own accord and say, I accept this gift. I accept this. He is my Messiah. He died for me, and I accept it, and I'm going to take it. And, uh, and I believe. And by this faith that you have, you will be led to do. That's why James says, faith without works is dead. Very simple. It's really uh, all flows together if you can know and understand what they're talking about. Now listen to this. He says, he says, um, for no one is a Jew. He says, but uh, a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart. See this? He doesn't say circumcision is of no effect. He says circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not the letter. Okay, you have to be. It has to be done by because of the heart. Okay, his praise is not from man, but from God. So, in other words, you're not going to be circumcised just to be somebody in front of men. You're doing it to be someone, to be a child of God. Okay, let's read that again. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Now, you'll have some scholars tell you, see, oh, he's talking about the circumcision of the heart, the circumcision of the heart. Well, you don't have the circumcision of the heart if you're not following the things of God. And that's what it says. He who says he knows him doesn't keep his commandments is what? A liar. And the truth is not in him. So that completely blows that theory out of the water. Circumcision, just like baptism, is a matter of the heart. It is a matter of the heart and must be done in such or it is of no effect. Okay. Now, to even nail this down farther, let's go to the third chapter. We're just going to touch on this. He says, then, he says, what advantage has the Jew? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way, he says. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithlessness of God? And we're just going to stop right there and uh, for today, because that's a lot of information uh, that we have coming to you today. I hope you were blessed by this, and uh, I hope that you uh, can know and understand this. Um, I want to read to you a couple of things. I do have a couple of scriptures I just want to put in your hearing to lock this down. Let's go to Hebrews 10.26 before I let you go. And let's read that. Here's what it says. It says, what is now, remember now, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. What is the, what is the wages of sin? Death. What did our Messiah come to die for? He said, I didn't come to abolish the law, so that wasn't it. What did he come to abolish? He came to abolish the penalty for sin. The sin of law and uh, of sin and death is what he came to do away with. Okay? So, and it proves it out right here in Hebrews. It says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So you cannot just continue to sin. There's no such thing as once saved, always saved. And anybody who reads the scripture can know this and can understand this. Let's look at Romans 11:21. I just want to I just want to wrench that down. Uh, we're going to jump ahead in the book of Romans here, just very quickly. 11, and we're going to go to 21 here. Okay. Now listen to what he says about being grafted into the olive tree, which is the Israelites. He says this, he says, For for if God did not spare the natural branches, who's he talking about? He's talking about the Jews. They were cut off. Why? Because they didn't believe in the Messiah. Okay, so they're cut off. He said, So for if God did not spare the natural branches, the Jews, neither will he spare you, Gentile. Note then the kindness and the severity of God, severity towards those who have fallen, okay, the Jews, okay? But God's kindness to you, listen to this now, provided you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. So can you be cut out of the olive tree? You certainly can be. No such thing as once saved, always saved. My friends, we need to know this and we need to understand this. This is so very, very important. Uh, again, James 2.17, let's just, these are very quick. I want to jump down there. Uh, 
and 17. What's it say here? Very quickly. So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. It is dead. And if we jump down here to 24, it says, You see that a person is justified by works and not faith alone. Not faith alone. James 2, 24. James 2, 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Okay? Okay. So those were the last straggler scriptures that I wanted to uh, bring to your attention here. Let me go to the right screen here. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Now, uh, I hope and I pray that this teaching was a blessing to you, and I hope uh, that, and you know and understand why Peter warned us that Paul's writings were hard to understand. They are hard, aren't they? They're hard to understand. You can't just read them and rip through them and be quick about it and, and think that you're going to understand them because you'll understand the wrong thing. And again, that is exactly why our Messiah spoke in parables. Why? When the... When the uh, apostles asked him. He said, well, "They said, why do why do you speak to them in parables? Why do you do that?" And he says, "Because I do not want the wicked to understand." And this is exactly, I believe, why he had Paul teach and preach in such a way. And and he didn't. He just left it there. He did give us that one clue through Peter that said, "Hey, just want to let you people who who know me, who have a heart for me." I want you to know and understand the writings of Paul are hard to understand. And it's amazing how he just kind of tucked that away in Peter's writings, you know. Uh, but once again, that comes from studying. Study to show yourself approved. He knew, he knew that only those who study would find that. He knew that. Only those of us who are studying, who are sitting here, taking the time to comb through these scriptures, to look at these things, he knew that only we would find them. Only those who had a heart for him would find the, the scriptures and would understand these things. So uh, I hope and I pray that you understand them. Now I know and I understand that there are going to be many of you out there, many people that are going to see this video and they're going to scoff, they're going to wave it off, they're going to roll their eyes, they're going to walk away. And uh, we know that because th the Bible tells us that. He says, many are called, but only few are chosen. As straight is the gate, narrow is the path, few there be that find it. Many biblical scholars will also write those scriptures off as well. But we can know and we can understand that this is exactly true. There is a lot of people that are just simply not going to accept the truth. Uh, and, and many of them that won't take the time. What have we been here, like an hour now, something like that? Uh, many people are just not going to take the time. They're, they're too busy. They don't want to be bothered with it. They don't want to understand it. But when you take the time to sit down, you know, that's why he gives us his Sabbath day. Slow down. I know the world is going to run you ragged. Slow down. Spend your time with me. Let me speak to you. Then we begin to understand. Once we obey him, more blessings are given. And he sees once we are given truth and we act on that truth, more truth is given. And it tells us in the Bible that he who has much, much that has been given, will receive even more. But he who has little, even what he has, will be taken from him. Because why? Because he, he gave, was given a little bit of truth, but he didn't act on it. He didn't care. Okay? So it's all going to be taken away from him. But the one who was given truth and did that truth and was obedient to the truth, that person will be given even more. I hope this all makes sense to you. And we could go on and on and on. And uh, I don't want to drag this out to be longer than uh, what most people will will take in one sitting. It's a lot to swallow, and it's a lot to know and understand. But I hope and I pray that you do understand uh, what is going on uh, in the book of Romans. And I hope and I pray that this is going to be a blessing for you and your family. And I want you, here's what I want you to do. This is going to be your homework. I want you to, to work on this as a family together, if you're with a family, or with your, if you're with a Bible study. I want you to work on teaching Romans chapter 2 to someone else, okay? And have that person just imagine that they don't know anything and have them ask questions and have them make you prove it to them, okay? And you teach that to someone. I want you to learn how to teach this. It doesn't do us any good to teach this and to eat this fresh manna and then not share it. So we got to learn how to teach it. So I want you to know it well enough that you can teach it yourself, okay? And for those of you who aren't sure about this and you're kind of on the fence about this, 
Use this as a springboard into your own investigation. Pray for the discernment. Go into your prayer closet and pray for the discernment to understand this. Is this correct or is this incorrect? You need to know, and he'll tell you if you'll ask him. But with all of that being said, I just want to say God bless you. Thank you. You know what? You guys mean so much to me to stay here. If you're still here with me after all of this, God bless you for wanting to know the truth. Uh, my hope and my prayer is that the grace and the peace of God would be upon you and that the protection of God's hand also would be upon you. God bless you. Thank you so very much for sharing your time with us here today. And shalom.